This passage is Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 10 through 25. Last week we did Shema, the love of the Lord your God, and that was the main theme for the book of Deuteronomy. It might be in the entire book of Pentateuch, and it can be used for the entire Bible as well. So love the Lord your God, who explained to you about what the Lord means and God means in this context. This passage is picking up from verse 10, and its main theme is, Remember the Lord your God. Two sections. Remembering the Lord your God is verse 10 through 19, and verse 20 through 25 is teaching what the Lord has commanded us to do at home. Let's discuss about this one, because some people who just came to America and talk about the environment and situation in Korea, and they say it's a challenging environment to live as Christian in that country. But they're all saying, most of them are saying, it's a relatively better situation in America, so it's easier or better to live as Christians in this country. It's okay, that's that's fine, that's their perspective. So what they're saying is because of the social injustice issue and the fierce competition in the society, a high demand in different areas, and so they're saying the the worldly things to worry about is overwhelming there. And in America, it's kind of well off, relatively speaking, and we have more time. That's what they're thinking. So we can serve at church and then do the things that we can do as Christians. But let's ask ourselves, is that true? Just because we live in America, are we really better in terms of being a Christian in this world? in this country, at my workplace, at home, at church, whoever you meet, really, do they recognize you as, wow, no wonder you're Christian. If it happens to you, praise the Lord and continue, keep up the good work. But a lot of times it doesn't happen. So Regardless of the situation, when you're in a challenging situation, you may realize that, oh, there's a limitation that I can do. I cannot really do all these things by myself. But that's when you realize, okay, I have to rely on God more. And some people say this is a desirable environment, but because we can do a lot of things in this country, some people may think, okay, it's up to me. I can do all these things. I accomplished everything, so it's all up to me. That's not how we live as Christians. So whether you are not well off or you're well off, it doesn't really matter. Regardless of the situation, we got to be very careful. But the passage that we read is describing this worldly blessings that God has given us. But when that happens, when God blesses you with worldly blessings, you got to be careful. It says, then take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Do not forget the Lord your God. Interesting thing is, Israel the way they handle the situation or the way they reacted to the situation in their relationship with God is just amazing. Uh, not in a good way. All right, let's take a look at this one. The next passage says this, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Mesa. They tested God. In fact, they didn't test him. A lot of times we think we did something. But God was the one who tested them back then. It says this in Psalm 81. It says, In distress you called and I delivered you. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. I tested you 
at the waters of Meribah. Massa and Meribah is the same thing. So God tested him. So testing is God is putting us to go through this test to become better or stronger, or if you're not a true Christian or believer, then you're not going to stay there. So no matter how we cut it, people thought they were testing the Lord. And it was a difficult situation. So as we looked at earlier, difficult situation versus well-off situation. Some people say one is better than the other. Uh, a lot of times it's the opposite. When you're in a difficult situation, all you have to do, all you can do is rely on God. Because you know you cannot do anything on your own. As say prayed earlier, as we get older, our body does not really cooperate with us well. There's nothing we can do. We can exercise, we can eat well, but still, a sign of age doesn't go away. So this is what it is. When we see the limitation of our ability, all we can do is more and more rely on God. But these people, when they ran out of water, they tested God. What does that mean though? Does that mean we have to pray like this? Our girl's prayer and Proverbs. Um, so let's take a look at this one. It says, two things I ask of you, deny them not to me before I die. Remove far from me falsehood and lying, which is good. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me. Lest I be full and deny you, that's the warning passage that we had, and say, who is the Lord? I may forget who you are because if I'm full, if I'm rich, I may feel like I don't need you. Or, lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. If I become poor, if I become really um, a disadvantage in this society, I may break the law or do something not desirable as Christian. On the surface, all he's asking is, give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me. It's an amazing prayer. Very humble prayer, that is. On the surface. Long time ago, this prayer, it moved my heart. I said, wow, this is amazing. How can you pray like this? But now when we look at this prayer, you have to think about this. Is it really practical? Yes, it's practical. But is this biblical? Maybe not. Maybe not. This portion of the prayer is basically implying that depending on the situation, I may do evil things. I may forget you if I get rich. If I get poor, I may do something that's not right for me to do. So, Lord, please give me enough food, enough wealth to live, so I don't have to do anything. I don't have to worry about anything. Really, that's convenient, right? If you have nothing to worry about, you're not rich, but you're guaranteed to have daily bread all the rest of your life, and you have enough money to spend, then okay, that's perfect. But how many of us can say that? God is telling us, as Paul mentioned in Philippians chapter 4, no matter what the situation is, you should learn how to be content in the Lord. Better yet, you have to learn how to rejoice in Christ Jesus because he saved you. Not because what's happening around you, but because of the Lord, we got to be rejoicing in our life. So this one, think twice, and you may want to meditate on it and let me know if you have other thoughts on this one. But biblically speaking, yeah, in a way it's okay, but I don't think I'm going to pray this way. So Israel, what did they really test about God? This is what happened. The same instance, this instance that Moses referred to in his sermon here. It's going back to Exodus chapter 17. It says this, And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, 
because of the quarreling of the people of Israel, and because they tested the Lord by saying, what did they say? Is the Lord among us or not? Is he here? Does he really exist? How can this happen if he is really true God? And if he is really with us, how can we run out of water? We're thirsty. We may die like this. These people are complaining about lack of something. In today's passage, Moses is warning them, when you get rich, be very careful. Don't forget the Lord your God. So I'm not sure. These people are not happy when they're not well off. They may forget God altogether when they become better off. What shall we do? But we have to live, reflect on our lives. Are we one of them? Do we constantly complain about the situation, any situation? Are we ever content with what's happening with to my life? Or do we ever rejoice in the Lord regardless of the situation constantly as much as we can? We have to ask ourselves those questions. And that, is God with us? Is he really there? Does he exist? That question came to us in the New Testament time period too. When the Satan, the devil, was tempting Jesus Christ, he said this, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against the stone. So he was quoting a, a Bible passage there. And Jesus said, Again, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. He quoted the exact verse that we just read together. Deuteronomy 6, verse 16. He was quoting that to overcome that temptation. So where does this mindset or doubt this complaint or temptation come from? The source of this kind of mindset is the devil. He's the one who's testing our faith, tempting in that sense. He's the one, he's the first tempter in Genesis. He asked Eve, did God really say that? And as you all know what happened afterwards but when he tempted jesus he said clearly the bible says this it's not going to happen so we all have to be equipped with the word of god whatever the situation is we should be able to go back to the source which is the lord and the word of god and see what does the bible say and based on that we can make our decision Unfortunately, those people who were in the Old Testament, they didn't really listen to the Word of God. Numbers 14, 22 through 23 says this, None of the men who have seen my glory and my signs that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and yet have put me to the test these ten times and have not obeyed my voice. They didn't just test God. They didn't obey God's commandment. They're not going to see the land that I swore to give to their fathers. None of them, man. None of them. And none of those who despise me shall see it. You don't have to show your anger or opposition to God's commandment explicitly. You don't have to show it. If you believe that, I'm not going to follow that in your heart. That's what it is. Same thing. You don't have to show your opposition. All you have to do is think of it as, okay, it's not relevant. I'm not going to follow God's command. Then none of them, none of those people who despise God's command will see the land that God has promised to give them. So try in God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. 
It's one God. But we're testing God the Father in the Old Testament. Okay, that's bad enough. But specifically, we are going against Christ. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it says, For I do not want you to be unaware. It says, okay, I don't want you to be ignorant about this one. Please note that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples for us. These are the examples that we're not supposed to follow, right? That we might not desire evil as they did. It's an example to see and avoid. We don't want to repeat the same mistake. If you look at your life up to this point, God was sustaining your life up to this point. God has given you family, whether you have one member in your family, five or six members in your family, it doesn't matter. You're not alone. And God also gave you the church that you can serve, school that you can attend, and the work that you can work at and use your talents that God has given you. So all these things, the friends and everybody around you, and all the things that you possess, God gave you those things. And yet, just like these Israelites, a lot of people in this world do not listen to the word of God. And they're going against Christ Jesus, the one they praise on Sundays, the one they profess that they believe in. I believe in Jesus Christ. And then they go against them. So when God blesses you with the worldly blessings, do not forget who he is. Because he is the Lord our God. We shall fear, we shall serve, and by his name we shall swear. He is the one we have to serve all the rest of our lives. But as we have gone through this Deuteronomy and Philippians up to this point and throughout your spiritual life, throughout all the sermons that you have heard up to this point, you must hear the same thing over and over again. Today's passage says this, Then take care lest you forget the Lord you brought you, he who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Check out chapter 4, verse 23. Very similar expression there. And Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 11 says, Take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping His commandments, His rules and His statutes, which I command you today. Moses is warning again, Do not forget the Lord your God. So if you hear the same thing over and over again, what happens? It gets boring. It doesn't really hit you as strong as it hit you in the first place. But please note, we are going to hear the same thing over and over again and add a little more details later for the rest of our lives and in eternity. Because it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. He's the same Jesus. You're not going to get a new version of Jesus Christ or newer God down the road. The same God explained in the Bible, which doesn't change. So you better get ready to get excited with the same thing over and over again. 
And the rest of the chapter, it says, Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings. That's the key point. We're always looking for something new, something amazing, something miraculous that you've never experienced and heard before. But that's not the main point. Because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. The reason why we're led away by diverse and strange teachings in this world is because that's a human tendency, human nature. Let me show you in this graph. Time and eternity, right? And love, passion, intensity, our interest, etc., etc. High, right? High and low. The human nature. Initially, we may have high level of intensity, love, passion, interest, everything. We're interested in something initially. Human relationship, new hobby, games, whatever it is. As time goes by, the interest or passion or love usually goes down. That's human nature. It usually goes down. However, as we read from Hebrews, God does not change. His word is perfect. His love is perfect. His word lasts forever. His perfect love lasts forever. This is forever. It goes on forever, right? Hours and some time. But God's love and his word stand forever and ever. So true Christians, mature Christians, as time goes by, they are striving for God's perfect word and everlasting love. And they practice those things in their lives. We never get there. We're not going to get to the perfection. But we don't go down like this and stay there. We go up a notch every day. Right? We have to go up and get to closer to God's word and his perfect love in our daily lives. That's what faithful Christians do. And the second half of Deuteronomy chapter 6, it says this, okay, you don't forget who the Lord your God is, and then we're going to have a family conversation. When your son asks you in time to come, in the future, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the rules that the Lord our God has commanded you? That's a very gentle question, but in today's term, people may ask you, your children or for your friends, you may, they may ask you, why Christianity? Why do you have to go to church and read the Bible and pray? We have to respect other religions. Yes, we have to. But this is the only way to uh, salvation. And they're saying spiritual life versus social life. Spiritual life is kind of separate. You know, it's not really relevant to my job or work. So please, dad, please, mom, you know, I don't think it's really that important. They may ask that question. Then what's the normal parent's response? Ask Sunday school teacher or pastors or some honest parents. Uh, then they may say, I don't know, really. And they try to change the subject by saying, um, did you take out the trash and that kind of thing? So that's not a good conversation. That's not how it should go. This is a golden opportunity to witness the gospel. This is a great opportunity for you to have a conversation with your children because how many of us have this conversation with your children or your parents on a regular basis? It's really tough. It's tough to see each other and have meals together. So whatever happens, when this opportunity comes, then you have to grab it and go on with the next conversation. This should take place. Then you shall say to your son, daughter, or friends, or family members, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. It goes on. Explains what the Lord showed the signs and miracles. 
And this is what the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, starting with fearing the Lord. And this explanation needs to take place every time you have this conversation. It's really tough to have one conversation about one subject matter and expecting somebody to understand 100%. Especially the Bible. I explained to you about this Agur's prayer in Proverbs. Initially, long time ago, about, uh, I don't know, 15 years ago, I was moved by that prayer, which is still great. But now, I review that and thinking about the entire context of the Bible. Is it really biblical to pray that way? I'm asking that question. I do not have a definite answer to that question, but at this point, who knows? I may have a deeper understanding later on. At this point, in this context, I do not wish to pray that way because I want to pray like Paul did expressed his contentment in Christ. I want to pray to God, God, please give me this joy in my heart, regardless of the situation around me, which is tough. That's what I'm praying about. If I don't have to worry about the future, just like this prayer that we read, then what should I pray about? Everything is handy dandy and everything's good and I'm on top of the world, really right? I may not pray as much. So th think about these things. So the family setting, the family conversation takes place and you are going through the same or similar subject matter over and over and over again. You still have to appreciate the same truth over and over and over again. Let me show you this one, though, before we go on, before we finish. I mentioned this to you. Human nature, it goes kind of down, meaning the appreciation about your family members, appreciation about your job, the level of appreciation may go down. You just take them for granted. You take God for granted. So every day you hear the same thing, then okay, that's fine. I, I heard enough. The fact that God's love and his word doesn't change because it's fullness of his love. His love doesn't go down in terms of level or goes up sometimes. It's not like it doesn't change. It's always perfectly full God's love, perfect everlasting love, right? And his word. The way he sees us, the believers, Christians, every single time, he sees us. He constantly sees us. His love and his affection for us does not change. It does not go down. He loves us with his full love, perfect love, always. That's what we're striving for here. So again, we heard repentance, Jesus, salvation, everlasting love, God's word, God's commandment, all the time but we have to hear those things and receive those words and expressions in god's word with a new perspective all the time as if you hear them for the first time so this one this passage says this therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard lest we drift away from it We've been hearing all these things, but pay closer attention, guys. Always. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, those people who didn't follow, he didn't obey God's commandment, they got what they deserved to receive, a just retribution. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation. Guys, the salvation is a big deal. It's a life or death deal. And how can we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? 
It's a rhetorical question. We cannot escape from that retribution by neglecting an opportunity to walk with God. It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. The faithful believers around us, the faithful believers who came before us and with the Lord now, they are the testimonies of this great salvation that we received. So please, if you hear the word salvation, if you hear the word Jesus, repentance, everlasting love, please just don't take it for granted. Every single word has eternal consequence.